ICFRC hosts community programs to address topics of international interest. We thank our members, volunteers, and interns for making these forums possible since Richard Schultz changed the name of his small Minneapolis stereo shop to Best Buy in 1983. I want to acknowledge our university and community supporters, the University of Iowa's international programs, the University of Iowa's honors program, the University of Iowa Center for Public Policy, and the Stanley UI Foundation support organization for their financial support. And I thank today's special sponsors, Iowa United Nations Association and John Menninger. It is my pleasure to introduce Andrea Cohen. Andrea Cohen is the executive director of the Iowa United Nations Association. Andrea attended the United Nations International School in New York, where she experienced valuable lessons in global learning and international unity from among the 120 nationalities represented at the school. Andrea has a BA in anthropology from Barnard College, a master's in anthropology and education from the Teachers College in Columbia University, and a master of science in teaching from the Free University in Amsterdam. Andrea is originally Dutch and moved to New York City in the early 1960s, living there for about 28 years before moving back to the Leather Netherlands, where she spent 21 years before moving back to Iowa City in 2012. Andrea is an Iowa City Human Rights Commissioner and a member of the University of Iowa Center for Human Rights. Please join me in welcoming Andrea Cohen. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Yes, I can say good afternoon now. Um, I'd like to thank the Academy. I mean, I'd like to thank the <laughs> Iowa City Foreign Relations Council for inviting me. This is a real honor. Um, when I schedule events, it's usually horrible weather. But when I do presentations, apparently it's good weather. So I'm not sure what to do in the future. but. I guess presentations is the answer. Um, when we get to the question portion of um, today, I, if I can't answer a question, because I really don't know everything, um, I have plenty of Iowa UNA members here who can help out and certainly correct me if I'm wrong. Um, one thing I would like to note is I have the UN in my blood, um, in my DNA. I went to the United Nations International School and I was honored to be able to graduate in the General Assembly. I will never show anybody the pictures of that graduation, <laughs> but uh, it really was um, a unique experience to be there. And sometimes I have trouble, just like others in other situations, figuring out how come you don't understand this? Um, because for me it's such a given and I have been working very hard um, <clears throat> for many years as a human rights educator and a, and a UN supporter to find language that explains what I feel but that also strikes a chord with you in this particular instance today so that we can move the conversation along beyond that. So with that, I will um, once again attempt to articulate what I know and what I think and what I feel. An educated consumer is our best customer. If you're a New Yorker, you'll recognize the slogan belonging to Sims Discount Clothing Stores. I guess nobody is a New Yorker here. <laughs> okay, well, I saw one hand there. Oh. I've borrowed the slogan many times because it brilliantly captures the essence of knowledge and action. So let me make you the UN's best customer. I'll start by reviewing what we know about the UN. And you're not supposed to be able to read this. <laughs> According to its charter, the UN aims to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, 
to establish conditions under which justice and respect for the obligations arising from treaties and other sources of international law can be maintained, and to promote social progress and better standards of living in larger freedom. The first thing we know is that the UN has set an ambitious set of goals. But then the atrocities perpetrated by certain governments against their own and foreign citizens, the violations of human rights and dignity, provided ample justification for idealism. We also know that the UN is not a world government. During the past 72 years, the UN has provided a forum for member states, and today there are 193, to debate, discuss, and find compromise for action to tackle some of the world's thorniest problems. It is a collaborative, serving at the pleasure of the member states. It is not perfect. It has a tough political balancing act to perform, balancing the politics, <coughs> economics, interests, values, and norms of a diverse group of countries. And we know there are over 70 programs, funds, and specialized agencies that do the work of the UN. It's not just about votes in the Security Council and speeches in the General Assembly. It's about a global forum where countries can raise and discuss the most difficult issues, including problems of war and peace. In addition to maintaining international peace and security, the United Nations protects human rights, delivers humanitarian aid, promotes sustainable development, and upholds international law. The devil is in the details. UNICEF, UNHCR, UNFPO, WHO, World Bank, WFP, IMF, FAO, and all the rest of those acronyms, all develop and implement the work needed to tackle the pressing issues raised in the General Assembly and the Security Council. Issues such as threats from terrorism and nuclear weapons. This year alone, four famines with 20 million lives hanging in the balance and the world's worst refugee crisis since World War II. It's all well and good. But the UN has its critics. The US withdrew from UNESCO last week, although it had already stopped paying dues in 2011, citing anti-Israel bias. The United Nations Security Council does not have true international representation. This has led to accusations that it only addresses the strategic interests and political motives of the permanent members. Peacekeepers rape. It's too bureaucratic. Does the UN actually do anything? <laughs> well, yes it does. It is responsible conventions for conventions and treaties, but not just any old conventions and treaties, international conventions and treaties, such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the Sustainable Development Goals. All 193 member nations adopted the SDGs in 2015. Countries big and small, rich and poor, with different cultures, religions, languages, and forms of government, all agreed to achieve this global to-do list by 2030. Refugees' first port of call is the UNHCR. Development projects cover water, agriculture, gender equality. Humanitarian aid provides tents, food, clothing, water, health care. The first and the continuing help after political, natural, economic, and ethnic disasters. UNICEF in Puerto Rico right now. Children, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the only country in the world that has yet to ratify the, con the Convention is the United States. Climate, the Paris Agreement, which the United States may have withdrawn from, but local governments, um, citizen groups have all taken up the slack to make sure we do meet those goals. While the organization is effective at monitoring, the UN's ability to enforce relies on the will of the member states. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights is not international law. Human rights abuses are monitored by states as well as many NGOs and UN agencies. Enforcement mechanisms are usually categorized by the type of UN body that receives communications or carries out the monitoring process. As an example, there are four broad categories of enforcement mechanisms. Charter-based, such as the UN Commission on the Status of Women, 
convention or treaty based, such as the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, mechanisms contained in UN specialized agencies, such as the ILO and the WHO, and rapporteurs appointed by the General Assembly, such as the Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women. Each mechanism monitors either a specific rights issue or adherence to a particular treaty. Enforcement of international human rights law is far more established through the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, the Yugoslavia Tribunal, for example, than the Paris Climate Accord. Every member votes in the General Assembly meeting. That gives UN decisions moral clout. UN decisions reflect the prevailing values and goals of the majority of its members. Thus, countries that don't comply know that they are in the minority. Finally, and that's only for the purposes of my remarks today because there's much more, the US is still a member of the UN, for now, and has a vested interest in maintaining a position of leadership. When the going gets tough, the tough should get going, not withdraw. So, we know the UN is a complex, ambitious, bureaucratic organization, and some question its effectiveness and relevance. We also know that people differ in what they find important because of norms and values, interests, power, authority, social inequalities and inequities, and beliefs. This influences the opinions they have and the choices they make. And there appears to be a moral imperative to align with the prevailing values and goals of the majority of its members. Can we, though, afford to be critical of the UN concept? Let's do some paradigm shifting to explore, dare I say, answer the question. Paraphrasing Thomas Kuhn from The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, just to show that I have a little bit of an academic background, a crisis in global peace and security arises when confidence is lost in the ability of the paradigm, the way the UN is understood and viewed, the concept of the UN, to solve particularly worrying puzzles. Crisis is followed by a revolutionary shift if the existing paradigm is superseded by a rival. So let me offer my alternate paradigm. I taught maatschappijleer in the Netherlands for seven years. Maatschappijleer is civics. Our topics were law, parliamentary democracy, politics, multicultural society, and the welfare state. We used the following framework with students to start their examination of social problems within each of these topics. What's the problem? Who's affected by the issue? What do those affected want and why? What are the causes of the problem? And how can the problem be solved? We defined a social problem as a situation where the issue negatively affects a large group of people. The causes of and the solutions to the problem provokes discussion. The media reports on the issue. It's on the public's radar. Government or political involvement is necessary for the problem to be solved. Topics we covered included crime, refugees, drugs, unemployment, and anything else that you can think of that would fall into that category. Now, I'm afraid you can't see this very well, but I'm going to go through the slide. <coughs> so the example I chose was gun control, because it's a pretty germane topic right now. So what's the problem? Well, gun control. Some of the questions you can ask about the problem are, is government trying to take away the right to bear arms? Should government have a monopoly on the right to bear arms? Are civil servants abusing their right to bear arms? Do people feel unsafe because gun ownership and use is too easy? So who's affected by the issue? Well, pretty much everyone, and that's a lot of people. Victims, families, friends, adults, children, communities, gun owners and bearers, and the list goes on. What do those affected want and why? Well, that's the problem. People want different things for different reasons. The right to bear arms. The right to bear arms within limits. No civilian right to bear arms. What are the causes of the problem? Well, right now, increased civilian gun violence, like mass shootings, and increased civil servant gun use. How can we solve the problem? Well, there's going to be heated debate. Government and 
some political involvement is necessary, and I don't think there's much chance of voluntary action here. And what kind of government or political action am I talking about? Legislation, monitoring, and enforcement. How gun control will be solved depends on the following. The views of those who have the most power, such as elected officials in the NRA. The ability of the opposition to influence decision makers. The political gr clout each group has. Clearly, gun control fits the definition of a social problem. The cause and solution has consequences for a large group of people. And social change caused the changing views on gun control and the need for the issue to be addressed. Gun control is a topic of public discussion and is covered by the media. The gun control problem requires a communal solution. It's not something an individual can decide on behalf of and for all. Gun control highlights conflicting interests. So I've just given you a short lesson in Dutch civics. Your test will come later. Can we take it in Dutch? We can take it in absolutely. Although the um, non-Dutch speakers do get an extra point because they don't speak Dutch. <laughs> what you may wonder, does this have to do with the UN? Well, the key words and concepts of a social problem are large group of people. Changes in societal circumstances affect people's lives, viewpoints and, their ex and acceptance of the status quo. Discussion ensues, disagreements arise, compromise becomes increasingly necessary. There needs to be a political solution so that it applies to all, not just some. The UN and its ag agencies tackle global social problems, such as humanitarian aid, urban development, children's rights, global health, food assistance, green economy, refugee protection, climate action, sustainable tourism, gender equality, hunger eradication, sustainable cities, social protection, reproductive rights, freedom of trade, peace and justice, labor rights, women's empowerment, global vaccination, human rights, and I'm going to stop there. <laughs> the 17 Sustainable Development Goals summarize this very nicely. All UN member states came together with the help of strong U.S. leadership including the input of more than 70,000 Americans, many of them UNA, USA members, including people right here in Iowa. The global goals hold the power to transform the world, to end poverty, fight inequality, protect the planet, and drive economic growth and prosperity. In fact, the goals are a reframing of the values, principles, and aims of the UN as expressed in the Charter. The global goals give us a roadmap to a better world with each of us in the driver's seat. As Eleanor Roosevelt said, and for those who know me, I wish I was the reincarnation of Eleanor Roosevelt. Where, after all, do universal human rights begin? In small places, close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any maps of the world. Yet they are the world of the individual person, the neighborhood she lives in, the school or college she attends, the factory, farm, or office where she works. Such are the places where every man, woman, and child seeks equal justice, equal opportunity, equal dignity, without discrimination. I've already pointed out that the UN provides a forum for 193 member states to debate, discuss, and find compromise for action to tackle some of the world's thorniest problems. It is a collaborative. It tackles global social problems through partnerships, even at the detail level. The UN Global Compact, for example, provides opportunities for collaboration among UN, business, and civil society, society stakeholders. Partnering with the UN enables business to benefit from the credibility, know-how, experience, and global reach of many UN specialized agencies, funds, and programs, and it works the other way as well. I also believe we can apply the Dutch civics framework to the UN. It deals with problems that touch a large group of people. Global circumstances affect people's lives, viewpoints, and their acceptance of the status quo. It provides a forum for discussion, debate, compromise, and partnerships on a global scale. Solutions, such as conventions, treaties, and agency work, are political, balancing the interests, politics, economics, values, and norms of disparate nations. So let's look at an example on a UN scale. 
So the problem is arms control. I figure let's keep it with, you know, deadly weapons. That, that, that should work. Some of the questions you may want to ask, is the UN trying to cur curtail the bearing of arms? Are governments abusing the decision of having the right to bear arms? Do people feel unsafe because arms ownership and use is too easy? Who's affected by the issue? Everyone. And that's a lot more people than those affected by gun control in the United States. Some of the questions people there are governments, military, civilians, other life on land and life below water. We sometimes forget those life, other life on land creatures and those below water. What do those affected want and why? That's the problem. Governments want different things for different reasons. The right to buy arms for security, the right to have arms, but only certain countries, elimination of all or certain types of arms. What are the causes of the problem? Well, threats to peace and security posed by governments, their agents, and rogue groups. How can this problem be solved? Well, there's going to be multilateral heated debate, and we need multilateral agreements. Those are treaties in the case of the UN, but you also need monitoring and enforcement. The United Nations, in its work to assist people all over the world, is confronted every day with the negative impact of lax controls on the arms trade. In all parts of the world, the ready availability of weapons and ammunition has led to human suffering, political rep repression, crime and terror among civilian populations. Irresponsible arms transfers can destabilize security in a region, enable the violation of Security Council arms embargoes, and contribute to human rights abuses. Importantly, investment is discouraged and development disrupted in countries experiencing conflict and high levels of violence, which also affect their ability to attain the sustainable development goals. Anyone seen Lord of War? Oh, good, I get to surprise you. <laughs> Yuri Orlov is the main character. It's a wonderful, well, it's a wonderful movie. I, in a weird sort of way. There are 550 million firearms in worldwide circulation, he says. That's one firearm for every 12 people on the planet. The only question is, how do we arm the other 11? <laughs> Governments remain primarily responsible for providing security and protecting their populations, keeping to the rule of law. That is why they are expected to show responsibility in their decisions regarding international arms travel uh, transfers. I didn't arms travel, but OK. Um, so this is what the UN did, as the UN does. The swift entry into force of the Arms Trade Treaty, ATT, would be a clear indication of its signatory's willingness and determination to address the poorly regulated international arms trade. The United Nations is committed to supporting the full and effective implementation of the ATT. Now, I have to say here, I don't know if the United States was a signatory to the ATT. Inadequate controls on arms transfers have led to widespread availability and misuse of weapons. The landmark ATT regulating the international trade in conventional arms, and that includes small arms, battle tanks, combat aircraft, and warships, entered into force on the 24th of December 2014. So, Merry Christmas. I do want to say at this point that what I've described about um, the UN and working also has to do with every country. I mean, when I took this example of gun control and the right to bear arms or uh, no um, arms trafficking. That's the word I'm looking for. Because that global problem applies in and of itself to the United States, but that whole idea of gun control that is an American issue or social problem right now and here also has a larger implication. And so we could work together to see, you know, well, what did you do and how can we work on this together? I said earlier that I would offer an alternate paradigm. But alternative to what? 
Let's review the existing UN paradigm. A crisis in confidence in the UN's ability to solve particularly worrying global puzzles. How people understand and view the UN feeds this crisis. Issues are dealt with individually, some legitimately so, such as a natural disaster or the persecution of Rohingya. But many global problems have interconnected causes and require collaborative solutions. Oil spills in oceans have this annoying tendency of riding with the tide and going with the flow, crossing from international to territorial waters. Dirty air, otherwise known as pollution, doesn't respect politically designated national borders. Victims of internal conflict flee to neighboring countries. In each of these cases, a more holistic approach is needed. After all, pollution and refugees affect a large group of people. The people affected want peace, security, a sustainable environment, and respect for their human rights. The causes of pollution and refugee crises cut across borders, politics, beliefs, interests, and so forth. There needs to be a political solution that addresses most, if not all, of the causes and applies to all, not just some. In a forum where discussion, disagreement, debate, and compromise takes place between global partners. That forum is the UN, our greatest hope for future peace. If not the UN, then who? Thank you. Is health care a human right? Anytime one of my UNA Iowa people would like to jump in and help, please do. Is health care a human, a human right? Um, the right to health is a human right. It's in the UDHR, the Universal Declaration. It's also in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, if you're going to define the right to health care according to the debate that's going on in the United States, um, I'm of the opinion that no, you don't have the right to health care. You have the right to health and whatever the government or whatever the circumstances are in your country that can ensure your health, that's what you have a right to. <laughs> If anybody wants to disagree, I'm... Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm up for it. <laughs> what program does Iowa UNA do in Iowa? Children, climate change, as examples? Oh, man, we do the kitchen sink. Um, the Iowa UNA's um, vision is helping the UN build a better world. Um, and that's really broad, but that's what the values and principles of the UN are, and that's our guidance. Let me just make absolutely clear that the Iowa UNA is not a UN agency. We exist because people, even before the UN existed, when it was the League of Nations, um, American citizens or a certain group of American citizens decided that we need American support for the League of Nations if the League of Nations is going to be a success. It didn't work very well, um, but that's not because of the people who tried to convince American citizens that the League of Nations was a good idea. It just wasn't the right time for that. Um, when the, the UNA is a combination of two previous incarnations, the American Association for the UN, which Eleanor Roosevelt um, was a member of and promoted, and another one which, whose name I, I is escaping me right now. But anyway, the UNA of the United States of America was um, established. We exist since 1953 when Eleanor Roosevelt's brought our charter. Um, again, I wish I'd been alive to actually shake her hand, but fate was against me. Um, we promote Oh, Dorothy met her. Dorothy Paul, our uh, general chair, has. Um, <laughs> that's why I shake her hand a lot, because I know she shook Eleanor's hand. <laughs> um, but we promote, 
we educate about and we advocate for the UN. And it's not just about the values and principles of the UN over there. As I said before, there are also issues here in the United States that follow the values and principles of the UN. And so, for example, on Tuesday, we launched a project called Empower Her that um, looks to make reusable and disposable feminine hygiene products available to women and girls, both locally and globally. And you would maybe not think that schoolgirls here in Iowa, in fact, in the Iowa City Community School District, um, don't have, or some of them don't have, access to feminine hygiene products. And that is a health hazard, and it keeps them out of school, which is a quality of education hazard. Um, we also have a sustainability, we're promoting the 17 sustainability goals called with a project called Opening Doors to Sustainability. Um, if you want to know all the relevant details, Sky Corkin, my intern involved in that project, um, can answer them. But in brief, it's about educating um, people what those 17 goals are, what you think is important about the goals, how you support the goals, um, and what your vision is. We're asking people um, to draw or illustrate their idea of what a sustainable city looks like. So those are just some examples. Uh, we also do, a, uh, well, we'll be doing a great deal of advocacy work, primarily because the United States, or well, the current administration wants to, you know, like cut programs and funding to very important programs, which I don't know why. Um, so we, we're going to be advocating for that um, and continuing the work of Eleanor Roosevelt to get citizens, Iowans, to support the UN. Ooh, that was mm -hmm. like a long question. Right. <laughs> Do the members of the Security Council have the power to enforce what they like without the other members? This is where I'm going to look to some of my friends. Um, do they have the power to enforce? Um, enforcement in general at the UN is I mean, we have a lot of embargoes and resolutions to the UN, and it's some people will adhere to it and some people won't. Um, but in general, and please correct me if I'm wrong, the enforcement ability of the Security Council is not what you would expect it to be. It is at the discretion of whatever government is affected. Sorry, I wasn't clear. I'm offering that. You were saying what's an alternative paradigm. What I'm saying is basically if China, India, the U.S., the EU want to, to basically they have the power we've seen with their, how they've affected Iran and other countries, they have the effective power to basically do what they want. They could be an alternative on climate change, on arms, if they wish. Can you elaborate on that? And imagine if, if those groups, came, if the people came together to decide they wanted to enforce anything, basically they could agree on. That's the question that they agree. But if they wondered, who could stand, I mean, what, what country could effectively stand up to that combined force in terms of economics and military? Uh, if I'm understanding you correctly, I think anybody could stand up to them. Um, it, well, <laughs> if it's the, the UN isn't a world government. Well, I'm, you were asking what's an alternative. Right. I'm saying if that group of members decided to join up to impose sanctions, to use their military force, then couldn't they basically do what they like to do? They could. You, yes, I will grudgingly say yes. Um, but I think you would, uh, which is a problem that the UN has had in terms of its reputation and how people understand the UN, um, it's not... It doesn't have the ability to take over the sovereignty of a nation. So even if those five, um, whatever, the five permanent members of the Security Council said, you know, we're the ones in charge, we're the boss, and we're going to tell you what to do, that notion of sovereignty comes up all the time. Well, you can't tell me what to do. Um, but I think you're moving towards the idea of a world government, and that's something that I'm not sure we want 
and I'm not sure would be possible, but it's, it's worth thinking about that the enforcement ability of the UN might need to be stronger. I agree with that. Where can one find objective information about current issues and projects the UN is undertaking? I'm a former teacher. <laughs> what do you mean by objective? <laughs> I don't know who asked the question, but I, it, it's, I really am asking, what do you mean by objective information about the UN and its programs? Nobody's willing to. You can direct them towards the web page, which has uh, web pages for any of the uh, um, sections of the UN. Yes, that'll give you information about it, whether it's I'm, I'm sort of falling all over this notion of objective. Um, um, it will give you information, the facts and the figures and what's happening and what their successes are and what their challenges are and what their programs are. Absolutely, you can go to un.org. Um, I would encourage you to also look at different um, newspapers or magazines or journals that you are interested in reading. I would also encourage you to look at publications in the country of a specific program that you may be interested in. So if you're interested in the Rohingya situation, read newspapers or read some articles about the, um, from the perspective of um, the Sudanese, which one can, but anyway, it, it might, if you're going to become objective about this, then you need to also read well-rounded. Um, but the beginning, your first step would be the UN.org and the specific page for each organization, agency, or program. That's it? That's mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we now conclude our program. Uh, and I want to give a very big thank you to Andrea Cohen for her presentation. I also want to thank our sponsors, the University of Iowa International Programs, the University of Iowa's Honors Program, the University of Iowa Public Policy Center, and the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization for their generous support. And we also thank today's special sponsors, John Menninger and the Iowa United Nations Association. And we thank City Channel 4 for making our programs available to viewing audiences. Andrea, as a thank you, we would like to present you with the one, the only, the coveted <laughs> Iowa City Foreign Relations Council mug. <laughs> Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>